Uh, Dr. Krutzen, I would like to begin to ask you something about your family background, where you grew up and where you went to school and so on. Yeah, I'm uh, born in Amsterdam in 1933 and uh, well, until I, I became, in, until 1958 I was uh, basically all the time in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. uh, I, my family was uh, uh, say a, a workers' family. My father was a uh, waiter, mm -hmm. restaurant waiter. Uh, my mother uh, did some work in a hospital. Uh, life was not always easy, and of course, mm -hmm. uh, uh, from 1945 to 1950, though, uh, sorry, 40 to 45, there was the, the World War, yeah, and uh, the Netherlands were occupied by uh, the uh, German Nazi troops, and uh, so mm -hmm. the, we had that that experience also. Yes. Oh, yeah. that so also. even after the war of course things were a little slim mm. because uh, um, the, of course everything had to be built up again. Mm. Yes, so it was not an easy it time was not an easy in, start, in Europe no. particularly, mm. no. But, but so how did your interest in science then begin? Was it at an early age at school already or did it come Yeah, I, I did, uh, firstly I did quite well in school. Uh, I could, it was easy for me to mm -hmm. learn, uh, uh, especially natural sciences, but also languages. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was very er early interested in languages because my, um, my father uh, uh, was very good in French and he wanted to show this off on me, so mm -hmm. we had some uh, competition in that way, you can almost say. And my mother was born in Germany, so I could uh, uh -huh. speak German so to her. So you were multilingual from yeah, the beginning. Yeah, basically uh, from home to mm. bilingual, mm. but then through school and, uh, and uh, through context with my father, also French, mm. and then English. Mm -hmm. And later, of course, Swedish, Swedish mm -hmm. when yes. I moved to Sweden. Yes. But, uh, I, natural sciences I became interested in, I don't know how, it's just by reading books and the first books maybe were about uh, uh, explorations, uh, you know, the uh, uh, people, uh, the, the Jules Verne books, the uh, uh, stories about uh, the, uh, um, the, the march to the north and to the south pole mm -hmm. and, and, oh, yes. and so on. Uh, yeah. And I remember at home we we had a fantastic picture book uh, uh, about Yellowstone National Park. Mm -hmm. It was black and white, of course, but that book fascinated me so much. And things like that in the, uh, mm. uh, pushed me sort of in, 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 in the uh, scientific area. Yes, but then, then I, I understand that you did not immediately start to work in science. You were educated as an engineer from the beginning yeah. and were also worked as an engineer, as I understand it. Yeah. Well, a subject which I also was interested in was bridges. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in, of course, in Holland you have plenty of bridges. Yes. Uh, so uh, that uh, I, I read a lot about. Now, when I did my final exams uh, in the university for entrance into the university, the last year of uh, our high school, mm -hmm. uh, I was very sick uh, mm -hmm. and uh, had to do my exams. Uh, with very high fever oh, over yes. a two-week period, and so I, I, I had to do it that way because mm. if I didn't do the exams, I would have to wait another year. Uh -huh. So uh, there were no other oh, opportunities. So a tough system. Uh, a tough system. So I, uh, feverish, I went uh, to the uh, written examinations mm. and then part of the oral examinations, mm -hmm. and my grades, which came out at the end, were not top, they were reasonable, but not top, oh, and yes. not good enough to mm -hmm. get a stipend for university studies, mm -hmm. which I needed because my parents were certainly mm -hmm. not, uh, oh, yes. not able to pay f uh, too much for me. So I then decided, well, the other love is uh, bridges, mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. and uh, I then studied uh, bridge building and building of waterways, uh, locks, mm -hmm. etc. Uh, uh, in a uh, school which uh, is a higher technical school mm. but not the Institute of Technology, mm. so in between. Yes. It was a three-year course of which the second year was a practical year, so you earned some money mm -hmm. of which I could then survive uh, oh, yes. also the third year, so I wasn't so much of a burden to my, mm -hmm. to my parents. I see. 
So that's how I entered. Mm -hmm. I see. But then you also moved to Sweden after this period of, of studies, I, I realize. Yeah. Well, I met uh, a Finnish girl uh, on a mountain top in uh, Switzerland. She yes. was vacationing and I was sort of hiking in Switzerland. And uh, we started corresponding and I visited her. And uh, then in 1958 we married. And uh, then we decided to move halfway between mm -hmm. Finland and, Sweden, uh, and, and Holland. Uh, yes. And that is Sweden. And okay. uh, I learned Swedish, which uh, is a reasonably easy language to learn. It's yes. not very difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, the grammar is relatively simple. So uh, I worked in a house construction company for about one and a half years. And then I saw an advertisement by the University of Stockholm, the meteorology department. Mm -hmm. uh, they were looking for a programmer, a computer programmer. Mm -hmm. And although I had no background in that area, and um, but I thought, well, it must have something to do with mathematics, which I liked very much. Uh, I applied, and among quite many candidates, uh, they picked me for some mm -hmm. reason. And right. that was my big luck, <laughs> because yes. I then started working in the, at the Institute of Meteorology of mm -hmm. the University as a programmer, but they allowed me to go to courses in mathematics, mm -hmm. mathematical statistics, and then meteorology, very theoretical mm, courses, yes. because I could not uh, afford uh, doing uh, the more uh, experimental courses, which take time. You have to mm. spend uh, a considerable amount of hours in, in the lab, and mm. I couldn't afford mm. that. Yes. So I became, a, for that reason, the main, one of the reasons why I became a theoretician is, is because of, uh, yeah, practical. Yes, reasons. but so, so this is when your interest in atmospheric chemistry would arise then in this yeah, environment of meteorology or did it come later? It came later and um, initially I, I studied, as I said, uh, the mathematics, mathematical mm -hmm. statistics and then finally I decided let me try out meteorology and I must say it was a little bit of a uh, a, a little bit of a shock because uh, mathematics is so clean and mathematical statistics mm -hmm. it's, uh, uh, and, and meteorology is a very, in, very much also an intuitive mm -hmm. uh, uh, science. Uh, you have to bring in, you apply of course the laws of, uh, of, of dynamics and thermodynamics but then there's so many, the, the system around us is so complex mm -hmm. you have to be very very intuitive to pick the right oh, yes. uh, things uh, and um, at the institute after a while and it's about uh, 10 years or so or nine well a little less than 10 years i became a programmer for a, a u.s uh, scientist uh, mm -hmm. who uh, was going to get his phd at the institute of meteorology so i did the programming for him the subject was ozone Mm -hmm. It was one of the first models of the vertical distribution of ozone, which uh, uh, we, we developed. And while I was doing that, I yes. started studying uh, uh, photochemistry, and I got suddenly fasc fascinated mm -hmm. oh, yes. and spectroscopy and so on. And, yes. uh, so, that so. became then uh, my... And one of the very important thing, things uh, I found out is that people just repeated themselves. Uh, it is s obvious that, you know, these sentences that this and this is true. Yes. Well, that, that was not so obvious to ah, me. Okay. So, I, start, so <laughs> I started doubting. You, you came with fresh eyes. Yeah, yeah. well, <laughs> that is uh, often the case. Yes. I was allowed to come with fresh eyes. Yes. It, I couldn't uh, have go uh, picked a better uh, environment to do my studies than the Institute of Meteorology. There mm -hmm. was a lot of support uh, for what I was doing. I got more and more freedom. To yes. Not to program for others, but to do. To, to really the, think about for, some for new myself, questions. Yeah. Yes. So it was very generous. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it was not totally legal, but. <laughs> well, <laughs> for the very good, obviously. Good, yeah. So yes. I, I, uh, I then discovered that uh, the reactions which were then supposed to explain the uh, composition of the ozone layer, the vertical distribution, so that they were insufficient. Mm -hmm that reaction rates were used, which gave about the right answer. Mm. But these reaction rates were wrong. Uh -huh, and so. that I, I discovered and I said, there must be something else. Mm -hmm. I, then 
came upon the idea that nitrogen oxides were controlling ozone mm -hmm. in the stratosphere. Yes. And that's a, uh, oh, in natural circumstances, uh, the, that was the first thought. But then I also very soon discovered that uh, big fleets of supersonic aircraft mm. were going to be built oh, yes. in, uh, in the United States, Boeing and mm. uh, the Concorde mm. between France and in England, and then also in, in Russia mm -hmm. or the Soviet Union, there mm. were big plans. Hundreds or up to mm. thousand mm. airplanes would be flying in the mm. stratosphere, mm. Mm. emitting NOx, and oh, that yes. would break down ozone. And, oh yes, and, and you independent of this. me, also United States scientist mm. uh, uh, Harold Johnston of Berkeley uh, made this discovery that the uh, purely uh, theoretical ideas I had about mm. the role of NOx suddenly became a big societal issue. Oh yes, whether one should build these planes mm. or not, mm. and. Uh, so it became, uh, then also the, the research in this area exploded. Before that, we were maybe a, a handful of scientists mm. worrying about, or not worrying, but studying the ozone layer. Yes. And suddenly it became a big public issue and mm. uh, lots of money was, for uh, research money was going into this direction yes, also. Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. But, but, so, but what, th this is an interesting question. Did the society immediately see the, the uh, serious uh, could say consequences of this just because you were a scientist projecting something or, yeah, or the, that, the, that, was that, surprising. that was accepted. Yeah. It was uh, surprising because I mean the, the, the uh, ideas were on the table and, and very soon of course no measures were immediately mm, taken. No. Uh, they still, the industry was hoping to build these planes mm, mm. but uh, it was clear that the major studies had to be conducted before mm. uh, this would uh, uh, this mm. expansion mm. of the air mm. aircraft mm. fleet which mm. would take place mm. and uh, we did several years of research three or four years on this topic mm. Mm. and at the end uh, suddenly there came another problem uh, which already existed yes. namely the release of chlorine into the stratosphere oh, yes. by the chlorofluorocarbon oh, yes. uh, gas so that was so we, we we laid the basis yes uh, mm. for the, an even worse concern, mm. namely mm. The, the spray cans. Oh yes, yeah. and they just came there. Yeah. So, but, but at this time then, you, you did move to the United States at some point here. In 1974. Yes. And I, I first, we, I was then a uh, B-trained uh, professor, mm -hmm. it was called. I was just elected to become one, but I already had decided to try it out in the United States mm -hmm. for a year yes. in Boulder, Colorado, National Center for Atmospheric Research. And then, uh, uh, well, one year was not enough, so mm. we did a second year and yes, finally. Yes, you stayed. We stayed there <laughs> yes. for uh, a period of mm. six mm. years, mm. and uh, I became director also for research mm. division at the mm. National Center. But, but then, w was it after you left Stockholm and went to the States that you did more serious work on, on the ozone and the NOx, or was that already? Before. The, it, it was, was before, before. That, yeah. Yes, so well, of course. I, I was involved in, in also in the uh, studies on the effects of chlorofluorocarbons. Mm, yes. And uh, then my interest also turned not only to the ozone in the stratosphere, mm. but also uh, close to ground in mm. the troposphere, and discovered that the nitrogen oxides did the opposite what they do in the stratosphere. In uh -huh. the stratosphere, be above about 20 kilometers, the nitrogen oxides catalytically destroy ozone. I see. But in the troposphere, they catalytically uh, produce ozone. I see. And these two thoughts, which uh, uh, came, uh, were basically uh, much of my work. Why is that so? Why, well, why do they go? Yeah, well Can you explain that in simple ways? Or well, it it's not so simple. You need a blackboard <laughs> to write <laughs> oh, some oh. equations down. <laughs> But uh, it's not only, I mean, the may, uh, if we, we only would consider the chemistry of the nitrogen mm -hmm. oxides, and indeed mm. ozone would be depleted everywhere. Mm. However, low down, we also have the emissions of hydrocarbons yes. from automobiles, but mm. even more by, by, uh, by, by forests. Mm. And it is the uh, products from the oxidation of the hydrocarbons mm -hmm together with the catalytic action of NOx, which yes. then creates ozone. Uh -huh. And of course oh, you yes. need sunlight. Mm. That's why mm. the photo photochemical smoke mm. is mainly mm. during summer under 
very stable conditions when hydrocarbons can uh, accumulate in the lower atmosphere mm. and also nitrogen oxides. Mm -hmm. Then you get these. Uh, but this this was known already for say uh, the Los Angeles area. What uh, one did not uh, consider is that these reactions basically take place everywhere. Oh yes, it's Slower, just a question of amounts that you have more in the big cities of the yeah, hydrocarbons. Yeah, but the, the total production <laughs> mm -hmm. of ozone in the troposphere is uh, much more. Uh, determined by the, what is happening in the wide world mm. and specifically yes, over yes. Los Angeles or I other see. parts mm -hmm. of the world. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that was another idea I brought in. Mm. And uh, well, they were nice ideas and uh, yes. I sort of survived well. on that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, obviously very important ideas that also had quite a large impact on how society then dealt with these problems because yeah. I realize yeah. nowadays we may still have supersonic planes, of course, but at least we don't have much spray cans anymore. Yeah, well, and very few supersonic mm. planes, yes. uh, less than 10, yes. and instead of thousands or so. Mm. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, and then if, if you then look now at the problems of the atmosphere, would you say that at least these questions are under control or would you say that we are still developing, uh, we could say, d dangerous conditions which are the result of things that we do wrong? I'm not talking now about the greenhouse effect, we'll come to that later, but what about the ozone? Even yeah. if the, 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 the ozone hole and those variations that we see, are they more or less natural and under control or are they mm. going uncontrolled? No, they are not uh, natural. The ozone hole is, is uh, mm. not would not be there without the input of the chlorofluorocarbons mm, by mm. human activities yes. in the atmosphere. Yeah. But we, we, we recognize that the yes. science mm. is uh, established uh, and uh, we, we have a very good picture mm. of what is happening and because of that also political decisions uh, mm. are more easily mm. made. Mm. In, if you stand there and say, well, it may be so, but maybe not, I mean, the mm. politician won't mm. do anything. No, no. Now, initially, we were in that state mm. also with yes. regard to the mm. ozone hole, but that didn't last very mm. long. It mm. was a question mm. of uh, three or four years mm. uh, when we uh, had all the pictures, the whole mm. picture together. Yes. It was so obvious that mm. uh, the chlorofluorocarbons were the culprit. Well, and then, uh, mm -hmm. over a number of years, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, emissions were reduced, mm. and since 1996, the chlorofluorocarbons are no longer produced in mm. the industrial yes. world. Yes. And uh, in the future, uh, near future, also in the uh, developing mm. world, mm. which anyhow have produced very little chlorofluorocarbons, mm. mm. there will be also regulations. Mm. So, and would that be enough to heal the whole? Yeah, yeah. You think? It, it, the, we cannot do more. Mm. There have been. It will take thirty, maybe up to even up to hundred years mm. before the ozone hole will have disappeared. Mm. But uh, that's uh, nature must have its its way now mm. because the uh, chlorofluorocarbon gases are so diluted in the atmosphere that you you cannot just take them out and, and destroy them. Mm. They, mm. <laughs> it's too late. Yes, and, we have uh, all the important. ideas which have been spread around so far uh, on, on mending the ozone layer have mm. been totally unpractical. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, mostly uh, many of those are also launched by former Milit military uh, laboratories mm -hmm. uh, who uh, wanted suddenly to save the world, and, uh, uh, and but uh, nothing. There is no has such come way. Out. No, no. And in fact, in principle, there are ways, but you you then create even worse conditions. Mm, yes. Yeah. So now we would. And the energy needed to to do that is so, so overwhelming that. Mm. Uh, uh, then you create enhanced another, carbon dioxide. Another uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. worse problem, yeah, perhaps. Yeah. Um, so um, then, um, what? Maybe we should spend a few minutes on the greenhouse effect and your opinions about the carbon dioxide problem and and what will. Mm -hmm. what, what's your opinion of of our future there? Yeah, we have still. Uh, maybe we can repeat yes, the question. Yes. We still have one. You asked me at the end, yes. have you forgotten something? Yes. And that, of course, there is one thing that we, we should also talk yes. about, and that is nuclear winter. Yes, of course. You, you yes, had that yes, on. Yes. Okay, good. Mm. Okay. But uh, the uh, um, question is about the uh, effect of uh, 
the emissions of greenhouse gases mm. in the atmosphere and climate. And in my opinion, there is very little doubt that uh, there is, a, is an effect that much of a, the temperature increase we are seeing is coming uh, from that. I mean, mm. it's, uh, you cannot say that this issue is as clear as in the chlorofluorocarbon issue. But uh, uh, it, it, it's so, so more logical mm. that um, we, we are heating up the atmosphere and the Earth's surface than not. Mm. Uh, the, we depend the, the warm temperatures on the whole on Earth uh, above freezing, 15 degrees above freezing, uh, is simply due to the presence of greenhouse mm. gases in the atmosphere. They, yes. they serve as a blanket over mm. us, mm. keeping the warm uh, radiation coming from the Earth uh, trapped. Mm. In fact, uh, the energy is recycled five to six times before it gets out into space. It's a wonderful uh, machine uh, oh, yes. doing this. Yes. And, uh, so, uh, and, and we are now adding greenhouse gases. Mm. Why wouldn't it be, uh, become Warmer, warmer? Yes. I mean, it's, it's so I think the others <laughs> should prove much more <laughs> yes. that those that saying there's, a, there's this. nothing uh, there than mm than yes. we. And, mm. But uh, still, uh, all the models we develop uh, indicate, uh, do th indicate the same. Uh, that doesn't prove models, of course, can be deficient, but uh, altogether, if you want to bet, you would be rather stupid to say mm. uh, it's not getting warmer. Yes, it's, uh, yes. It's the, by all yeah, likelihood. It's the, becoming the very And we clear. see it in, yes. in the temperature. Yes, yes. yes. for maybe uh, 15 years ago, if the statistics were not so clear about that, but I think that they, they are now, yeah. that it is definitely... And, and we are effect. at the beginning of the yes. warming. Uh, the, it will uh, accelerate if, uh, and that is inevitable, if people in the developing world are going to use as much, or approaching to use as much energy as we uh, are using uh, per capita in the uh, industrial world. Mm, yes. uh, countries like India per capita use uh, uh, only 10 to 20 percent of the energy uh, which is used mm. uh, by, the uh, by the United States. Mm. And so uh, they, of course, uh, want to have a similar uh, standard of living and mm. uh, yes. inevitably that will lead to larger emissions. Mm. So we should do every effort uh, to reduce the emissions mm. by saving energy, by developing alternative techniques uh, which do not depend on the burning of fossil fuels, mm. uh, whatever we can do. Yes. And, and maybe become a little more modest and mm. be satisfied mm. with, with somewhat less. But mm. uh, that's very hard for people to do. Yes, but that's not. It, it was probably easier to convince people not to use spray cans with, with Freon in them than to convince them of not using cars or, or that's such. Uh, uh, definitely. Yeah. That, that, mm. that is, but of course, uh, it, one can never predict the future, I suppose, but I'm sure that one will realize as this process goes on that one has to be more and more strict about doing something mm. in the developed countries, particularly we have yeah. to be going ahead, so yeah. to speak. Well, you said about predicting the future. Uh, we can, of course, we don't know everything. No. And we never know whether uh, we have uh, uh, our, 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 whether there are effects which become come as big surprises. Mm. For instance, the ozone hole mm. was far away from predicted by any mm. scientist. Mm. It was a few measurements by colleagues of the British Antarctic Survey over Antarctica which showed that ozone was go going down. No model predicted that. Mm. It was thought at that part of the world, ozone is, is in the most stable condition, as mm. you can imagine. Mm. And just mm. exactly there, That's ozone breaks down. Yes. In a height region in which normally ozone is at the maximum. Mm. Yes. And then suddenly, a few weeks, two months later, it is gone. Mm. In and how could that happen then? Does well, one know but that we now? What we had not considered uh, is that ice particles, which form in, in the stratosphere uh, mm -hmm. at uh, low temperatures, below minus 80 degrees, uh, that on these ice particles reactions take place, which oh, yes. lead to the conversion of relatively uh, stable, uh, we call it reservoir molecules, mm -hmm. into very aggressive chlorine atoms. Mm -hmm. and 
chlorine monoxide radicals, mm -hmm. which attack ozone very efficiently. Uh -huh. And the, the, these ice, the formation of the ice particles is, you can almost say, a natural process. Mm -hmm. Uh, that uh, is dependent on that's what it's happening over Antarctica mm. because it's simply cold in winter mm. time and early mm. spring. But the reactions on the ice particles involving chlorine, mm. they are of course coming from human activities. Yes. So and even so in the Antarctic, there is the spread of, of the, this chlorine that comes yeah, from well, other the parts life, of the world. The residence time in the atmosphere is uh, uh, of the order of 50 to 100 years, mm. so they have plenty of time to spread mm. from the middle latitudes in the northern hemisphere, yes. where they are mostly used, yes. into any corner mm. of the world. Oh, yes. So you find oh, them yeah. everywhere. You find them also mm. in ocean water mm. because mm. they are mm. Uh, mm. they are not very soluble in water, but uh, have mm. some solubility, mm. and yes. uh, we can follow that uh, their concentration in the oceans, and mm -hmm. then learn something about. The, the, the flow of uh, in, in the ocean. Mm, uh, also. Yes, so that's yes. another aspect, yeah. of course. Yes. So we, we have, uh, it, it just so happens that where you have the coldest places on Earth, that's where this uh, yeah. ozone yeah. Yeah. hole will form. Yeah. And the other thing is that uh, the, uh, um, the destruction of ozone is dependent on the uh, concentration of chlorine uh, atoms and chlorine monoxide radicals mm -hmm. to the power two. Aha, so it is a that, so, And thing. now we have <laughs> about six times more chlorine in the stratosphere yes. than under natural conditions. Yes. So the ozone destruction is, say, 36 times it's larger yes. Oh, yes. than natural. Mm -hmm. Under natural conditions, these reactions mm -hmm. would not have a, mm -hmm. a, 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 a very low probability. But because of our input of chlorine mm -hmm. in the stratosphere, mm -hmm. these large I amounts, yes. uh, by small emissions every year, but uh, because adding of the long up. lifetime of the mm -hmm. species adding up, adding up, until we have now six times more chlorine in the stratosphere than under natural conditions. Yes. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned uh, one other thing you wanted to, to speak about uh, when we talk about these different scientific topics. I had also another question about what is your wo major interest right now, so to speak. But maybe you want to bring up this well, question to begin well, with. Uh, you mean nuclear winter? Yes, yeah. yes. Well, one of the things uh, I have been very much involved in the past with uh, studying the effects of biomass burning in the tropics mm -hmm. on atmospheric chemistry. Yes, yes. It's normally assumed that the tropics is a very clean part of our mm -hmm. environment mm -hmm. um, and, and people go on vacation to the most wonderful places and of course mm -hmm. uh, they don't, they're not thinking about pollution there. However, uh, the pollution is not only created by industry mm -hmm. but also by uh, biomass burning, and mm. that is happening a lot in the tropics. Mm. We have deforestation activities, we have uh, people burn uh, just to, uh, to cook, or they burn uh, uh, to, uh, to get rid of, 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 of uh, stubble or, mm. or, or mm. old wood mm. or mm. old yes. plant material. So mm. they burn everywhere. In the savanna regions of the world, about every year, uh, uh, half the area is burned. Uh, to get rid of the high, dry, oh, yes. yellow grass, mm. which uh, is not very fa uh, fancy, it's not fancied much by, by uh, cattle, uh, for mm. instance. Mm. So this is a lot of pollution coming into the atmosphere yes. in the tropics. So mm. that has been one scientific activity uh, of me and related also to human activities. But another, uh, out of that, uh, my interest in that uh, came a totally uh, uh, by uh, by chance, uh, one day uh, a thought what w that maybe uh, the fires which would be raging uh, following a nuclear war, major nuclear war in cities and mm -hmm. oil refineries, etc., bringing uh, large amounts of soot into the atmosphere, mm -hmm. what that would do to the radiation balance of the mm -hmm. atmosphere. And uh, um, what we found out, and that was actually that work was initiated by an invitation uh, by AMBIO, the uh, j Swedish uh, journal uh, mm, uh, yes. issued by the Swedish Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. Mm. They asked a number of scientists to uh, 
uh, to think about what would be the environmental consequences mm -hmm. of nuclear war. Initially, I didn't want to participate in this study. I thought, well, uh, nuclear war, everybody you hear, everybody is killed five or six times over. Mm. Uh, and uh, I believed, I was in the belief that this would be true. Uh, but uh, then uh, finally I realized this is not true. I mean, you, you can kill one person or a number of persons, six mm. or maybe even more times mm. over, mm. If, mm. I mean, mm. theoretically. Yes, yes. But people are spread all around the world. Mm. And uh, you, you cannot wipe out mm. a human race just by, by nuclear mm. bombs. You mm. can make an awful uh, world, but, mm. but to wipe out uh, human, uh, the humans altogether is, is a story mm. which mm. is not, mm. not true. But then we, we, one day, day when I thought about what is happening when all the soot mm -hmm. gets into the atmosphere, heavy fires deposited yes, yes. Uh, higher up in, in the atmosphere, and then we found out that that would block sunlight from reaching the Earth's surface. Mm -hmm. And we then would create almost something like an anti-greenhouse effect. In other words, that because of that, uh, the Earth's surface would cool very strongly. Mm -hmm. And the higher layers up into the atmosphere where the soot is would warm. Mm -hmm. So you get a temperature profile which is totally opposite to what, uh, what is, is mm -hmm. usual. Yes. When it is warmer, mm -hmm. low down mm -hmm. and, and than higher up. Right. So you turn the, the thermal structure of the mm -hmm. atmosphere upside mm -hmm. down. And we, we uh, uh, and of course photosynthesis is uh, is reduced mm -hmm. uh, under these circumstances. Then additional, uh, this became a big international study, and uh, additional facts were found. For instance, that uh, temperatures at the Earth's surface may go down below freezing, mm -hmm. and uh, that of course would be even during summertime mm -hmm. this could happen, mm -hmm. and uh, that would of course then uh, be. Uh, uh, disasters for food production mm. and so on. So mm. suddenly this idea that mankind, or a large part of it, could be really at, at risk mm. by a nuclear war suddenly became uh, mm. a hypothetical reality. Mm. But by, you could say, the after, after, after the fact effects, consequences. Yeah. And that on, is on dubbed the under the, yeah. goes under the name nuclear winter. Mm -hmm. that oh, yes. So that is a rather terrifying yeah. Prospect yeah. or, or aspect yeah. or, or e even worse than just yeah. The it's reality. not. It, it's really no fun to mm. think about uh, the this, the consequences. Mm. But when I look back, it's probably was the most important work mm. I have done, okay. and it uh, it's also a warning signal not just for for the past and the mm. present, but mm. also in mm. all future. Mm. Because nuclear bombs still are not abolished, and uh, there no. may be proliferation. And and maybe future use. So. Mm, yes. Well, so then I think um, uh, I, I uh, don't have any more questions on my notebook mm -hmm. here, but uh, maybe you just want to say something more, you could say, um, uh, less uh, pessimistic about the, our future. I yeah, mean, well, I... Disregarding now the nuclear War, yeah, well, which I mean, we all, of course, of hope co will never happen. Yeah, of course, we, we, we never know what the future will bring. Uh, there will be uh, large, there are large problems to solve, but uh, um, we can, we must hope that uh, um, our uh, the coming generations uh, will have learned from the past <coughs> and uh, will have learned from uh, these hor horrif horrifying. Uh, predictions and, and uh, that th things like this will not happen, but uh, I think uh, for that reason uh, uh, science is needed to, uh, to uh, understand and to warn for the wrong side effects of, of technological developments. Mm. Military developments are part of technological developments, yes. maybe uh, implying the negative side, a potential negative side. Mm. Okay. Okay. Thank you very yeah. much.